Hello, and welcome to the last lecture of this class before next week's presentations. I do want to make a couple of uh, quick announcements. Uh, the first is that uh, if you and or your group have some questions about your equity audit, please don't hesitate to reach out to me. Um, I know that I've, uh, things have been uh, a bit uh, tough uh, this past month uh, with uh, UCEA conference and convention happening, but uh, rest assured that I can make myself available and will make myself available for any questions that you have. Um, and um, and just, just shoot me an email and I will make sure that we will um, get to it and, and that I, I carve out the time to um, uh, help you think through your presentation or any questions that you might have. The second um, uh, announcement that I have is that on the D2L site, when you submit your final assignments, you will actually see two links. The first is to submit it to the D2L site. Um, the second will be to submit your link, uh, to submit your assignment over to the VIA site. Um, it is important that, that every student um, do two things, that you, every student individually submit it to the, the, um, the D2L site uh, under your own name, uh, as well as individually to the VIA site. So do not submit it as a group. Please submit it as an individual um, assignment to the site. Um, it, it doesn't matter if it has all your names on the assignment. The important thing is that you are turning in one individual um, assignment uh, per person. As you know, the VIA site uh, is uh, the uh, system that we use for accreditation purposes. And uh, as such, um, there needs to be a, a document or a, a log of all of the uh, assignments that you've uh, produced for um, through your through your um, tenure at this uh, at, at MSU, and uh, we uh, we utilize that for our own accreditation purposes. So please um, don't uh, just make sure that you that you um, uh, submit your assignment to both places, both the D2L site and to the VIA site. The link to the VIA site will be on the D2L site. And, um, and if you have any questions about that, please don't um, hesitate to reach out to me. Um, and uh, Or if the link is not working or anything of that nature, again, just reach out to me and I'll try to get a fixed ASAP. So as we switch over um, to this uh, particular lecture, uh, I will promise that this lecture will actually be very, very short. There are only five slides and uh, and we're covering new perspectives in educational leadership. And the reason why I kept it relatively short is because I'm actually not going to talk about the topics that are in um, or the, the actual readings. I think everybody did the readings and, and gets the general gist of what's going on here. I'm actually, um, I really want to talk more about the um, the content and um, and some of the main theories that that are being discussed. So today we're actually going to talk a little bit about um, uh, a couple of, of the different theories that that um, that were discussed, in particular critical race theory, um, community cultural wealth. Um, uh, uh, culturally responsive leadership, and then and those were kind of the three big things that that were talked about. Those are really and in, in the new perspectives that were that everyone's kind of talking about. As you'll see, all of the readings were from 2020 or are from 2020, um, so they they're they're fresh uh, and and those are kind of the contemporary issues that that folks are are taking up right now within the field. Uh, I wanted to expose you to that, but I also wanted to talk to you a little bit about some of these topics and what they mean uh, and how they're being used and, and, and uh, in the process, try to share how they connect to uh, the equity audit assignment that you're turning in for this class. So let's get, let's get to it and, uh, and segue to the, um, to the presentation. So um, critical race theory, uh, as folks know, um, CRT was a topic that, um, that was talked about uh, already in a previous class, but, um, but, but CRT um, uh, for, for, you know what it is is it's a, it's a theoretical uh, framework that um, folks have used and it, it actually emerged from the critical legal studies movement um, and uh, it it be, it came to the fore because um, it, uh, it people were really dissatisfied with the law the law was um, in the 1970s when people started doing the the work on um, critical legal studies um, this sense that the law was really being used to uphold, perpetuate, reify, reproduce kind of inequities in society, and and um, and the critical race theory movement emerged from that. Basically, how um, 
racial differences um, and racial inequities were um, being perpetuated through our legal system and how the law is actually used to uh, reproduce and normalize racism in society. And so that's really the, the foundation of where, um, where CRT uh, emerged from. It actually emerged from uh, critical legal studies. And as folks, um, as we learned the last time when we covered CRT, there are five tenets to, to critical um, uh, race theory. The first is the permanence of racism. And, uh, and that just basically means exactly what it means is that racism is permanent. It's not an aberration. It's not abnormal. It's not something that's kind of new or, or something that's gone away. It's, it's, a, it's part of the fabric of society since, since its inception. This country was founded on, on racism. It's still here. It's still very prevalent uh, in, in contemporary times, it's, except we don't see it. We've come to naturalize racism you know, on our, in our everyday uh, practices, in our everyday discourses, in our everyday policies, in our everyday laws. It's it's written everywhere. It's inscribed in 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 in, um, in in the fabric of this of this societal institution, and so it's it's kind of so natural. It's like the air we breathe. It is. We don't even see it anymore, or or a well worn pair of glasses. We we don't see the lenses through which we're through which we're we're seeing. And so oftentimes we're trained to, we're trained to think that racism is an aberration. That racism is something that exists by some evil perpetrator or person or being that you know and or who says the n word or who lynches or who does you know who believes in white supremacy. You no, know, this idea that you know that that racism, you know, is is separate from racist, right? It's not the individual racist, but the, the system is, is, is grounded in, um, in racism. And so when, when critical race theorists talk about racism, they really try to, to distinguish it from racists, from individuals who are racist. And yes, there are individuals who are, who are you know, bad people who are racist, but um, when we talk about racism, it is really a system. It's, it's, a, it's, it's, this, uh, it, it's, it's a way to describe the everyday racism that exists in society from our schools to our courts to our juridical apparatuses to um, uh, every social institution our banks our um, uh, you know our, our, our governmental institutions that would have you and that's and that's what you know these these structures kind of work together to perpetuate and reproduce races racial inequities in society the second uh, tenet of, of critical race theory is whiteness as property. This idea that um, whiteness is 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 a commodity that that people's whiteness, skin color, uh, is worth something, has a particular value. Um, the uh, in in uh, Plessy versus Ferguson, the the case that um, kind of instituted separate but equal. Oftentimes, pe people tend to think that that Plessy versus Ferguson was about. Um, you know, schools, separate but equal schools, but it really was about separate but equal train carts. And the way that story happened was that um, uh, the, the, um, the plaintiff was um, basically um, back in back in the day there was this uh, this idea that you know was the one drop rule, and um, and the the plaintiff basically was um, one eighth uh, black, but he passed as white, phonetically white, uh, you know, phenotypically rather not phonetically phenotypically white, looked white, passed as white, you know, could be white uh, as a as 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 a you know, if you were to look at this individual walking down the street, you'd see that this person was white, or you would think that they were, but they had one eighth black blood. Uh, and so they were back then what they would call an octoroon. Um, and, um, and so this person had uh, conducted business as a as a white individual did did things as a white person and 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 bought a train ticket and sat in the white part of the car. Um, the uh, the conductors kind of came to him said, "Hey, you're not you're not white. You need to sit in the in the in the uh, black uh, cart." And uh, and uh, he sued the 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 train uh, company saying that. Um, that he was no longer seen as a white person anymore because people now, since they outed um, him as a as a as a person uh, who had black blood, uh, he was no longer seen as as a as a black person, and so there was a damage that was done to him, uh, and so what he was suing for was that damage that that damage that he was no longer um, he can no longer receive the goodies that are associated with whiteness, the business contacts, the 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 the. Um, um, the ability to walk without being discriminated against um, in society, or or even you know have violence perpetrated on you, those are all the this this idea that that whiteness has some sort of exchange value that's associated with it, and that's really what whiteness is property um, is trying to get at. That whiteness has has a, a commodity. Whiteness has um, 
a, a, a value that's, that's that, that uh, and, and a currency that is attached to it people don't necessarily see it or recognize it and then again back to back to the you know permanence of racism we don't see it we don't recognize it we don't acknowledge it but there is some some um, some goodies that are associated with whiteness that are not necessarily associated with blackness or, or being a person of color and so this idea that whiteness has a has, that people have a, a, a property interest in whiteness and and want to maintain that property interest is a second tenet of um, critical race theory Interest convergence um, as uh, as a as another kind of tenet is that um, it, it's it's this belief that individuals won't um, white individuals and white society won't basically uh, move uh, or do things unless it's in their own self interest and in particular they won't do things for um, to advance the uh, civil rights agenda unless it's in their interest and so it's a very economic kind of um, uh, you know what do I get out of this so so this idea that um, that white individuals are actually making um, calculated um, you know um, uh, you know responses and and um, and really have this uh, this way of looking at the world that that you know uh, guarantees that um, the pace at which um, equity and equality advances is actually the pace at which white people are willing to advance it because if it's not in their interest then they're not going to advance any uh, anything that that doesn't benefit them and so this idea that there's an interest convergence that's controlled by by white people and white people are actually controlling the agenda then you know um, uh, it's uh, it's it's a um, it's an interesting kind of theory that that um, uh, plays out uh, in in many ways in the ways in which Derek Bell, who's one of the grandfathers of critical race theory, the way he talked about it was that um, uh, the uh, the civil rights movement um, uh, didn't you know wasn't didn't really happen in a nutshell didn't or devoid of any context. The context was that there was a war that was that, that had that had been you know um, going on, um, and and um, People were coming back. African Americans were coming back from from the from the war, particularly World War II at this time, and uh, they were coming back from a, from from the war, fighting a racist Hitler abroad, only to find out that that um, that you know there was racism in their own country, and so that, that that wasn't a good look for the United States, and so there was this big movement to try to you know undo that, you know, or try to address that in some way, in some respects, and so again, you know, we we didn't make these these. Um, these advances for for African Americans and, and other communities of color because you know it wasn't in their in the interest of the United States and it wasn't until they they started recognizing that it's it's a it, it was a hypocrisy to 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 you know and, and it made the United States look bad to have this kind of um, this these particular institutions in place that's when uh, the United States began to change and so uh, this idea that that um, if it's not in the interest of of white individuals or white society we won't make any kind of of advances um, with respect to um, uh, civil rights uh, for uh, people of color. That's the idea of interest convergence. Critique of liberalism or colorblindness is another tenet, and that's basically this idea that you know that uh, far too often we we want to look at the individuals you know by the by the uh, content of their character and not by the color of their skin. You know we we want to be colorblind, but but the problem with this colorblind ideology is that we re by refusing to see uh, individuals' colors and, and individuals' differences, racial differences, then we are in effect kind of you know um, pretending that these that these differences aren't aren't reality. They don't have any kind of material, um, um, uh, in, any kind of material effect in society. In other words, it it, it assumes that color color doesn't matter. It assumes that people, you know, when you when you don't see color, um, that um, you know, we we um, it, it suffice it to say that that um, it's a very liberal kind of logic. It's a very it, we love to believe that about ourselves, about our, about ourselves as a society that that we are colorblind, that we we would rather see an individuals you know as as a whole, but um, but we are in effect erasing their difference, and and also um, by erasing the difference, then we're pretending that the difference doesn't have any material effects in society, that race doesn't matter in society, and it does. As as we talked about whiteness as property, if if whiteness is a 
is a is a is something that's valued in society as 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 um, as that tenant suggests then race has to matter in society too so this idea of being colorblind is actually a falsity and so um and so this this idea that um that that we're colorblind is actually a a, a very conservative ultra conservative um, um, uh, idea that's kind of mass that uses language of, of liberalism to, um, to, to, to be disseminated and in, 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 within society. It becomes a palatable way, a palatable way of talking about, uh, about uh, this, um, these, um, or establishing and reifying, reproducing inequities. And rather uh, if by, by not talking about people's race. Um, so the, the issue, the, the last tenet is um, this issue of stories and counter stories. And, um, and, um, and that's a really interesting one because um, it's this idea that there's a stock story that's out there in society, that there's this kind of story that we have. And, and um, these, are, these are big kind of discourses, you know, if you will. Um, the Horatio Alger's uh, bootstraps, you know, put yourself up from your bootstraps. It's a story that we keep telling, um, uh, we, we keep telling in society that this, that this country is a nation of immigrants immigrants we keep telling that that uh, it's a welcoming society a nation of immigrants we tell that story over and over again it's a, it's a story that we want to believe about ourselves because it's a reflection of, of our values right but um but uh, but this I, the counter story is is um is what is not told it's a story that's suppressed it's a story that 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 we don't re don't often tell because it's a story that actually runs counter to the to the actual stock story that that we um that we believe and so this idea for example of the of the um, Horatio Alger story that if you work hard enough, you can, you, you can make it in society. You know, we have a lot of individuals who work very hard every day um, and, and they don't make it in society by, by any means. Um, and many of these individuals, you know, if you look at, if you look at them demographically, many of them um, have been, have been um, uh, poor for generations and demographically, it's also overwhelmingly non-white individuals. And so, um, and so the story that gets told about, you know, the bootstrap, straps is one that um, that doesn't often kind of pan out in in day-to-day -day life the issue of immigrants for example that we're that we're a nation of immigrants doesn't pan out you know in everyday life it doesn't it, it doesn't mean it much when you have kids in cages for example or you have family separation policies or you have um uh, um, individual, you know, individuals who've been treated bad for, gen you know, for generations. And even that story of, of, of being a nation of immigrants, it assumes that our doors were always open and it assumes that, you know, this kind of give me your poor, tired, hungry masses, you know, uh, that, that we, that we, again, part of the stock story of, 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 um, of the Statue of Liberty doesn't pan out. Um, every generation has always had its outgroup. Every, there's an immigrant group that's always been an outgroup. The Irish were an outgroup. The Polish were an outgroup. The Italians were an outgroup. Um, uh, Chinese were an outgroup. You know, um, uh, Latinos um, are an outgroup currently. Um, uh, and so, and so this idea that, you know, that, that somehow we're welcoming to, to, to all immigrant groups really doesn't pan out. And it, so again, we don't tell that, that, that counter story too often. Um, and so, you know, we, instead we'd like to tell the, the, the stock story that's out there and not tell the counter story, but the counter story kind of reflects a, a, a counter reality. And it speaks against um, the, the, the stories that we like to believe about ourselves. And so in a nutshell, this is these five tenets kind of create the 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 gist of critical race theory and uh, and it's a it's often used as a theoretical framework to help us understand and make sense of um, inequities that are happening in society including schools moving on the next uh, big concept that was discussed was um, community cultural wealth um, that uh, in order for us to kind of understand where that that particular framework came, came from, um, community cultural wealth really comes from the sociological work of Pierre Bourdieu, and uh, and Pierre Bourdieu really talked about um, two concepts of capital, you know, he introduced this idea that capital, just like, you know, money capital, you know, that, that individuals have um, certain certain uh, identity markers and certain things within themselves that are also, uh, that also have currency, you know, so, uh, so for example, there's, he, he coined this concept of social capital, and social capital really is who you know, you know, and who knows you, right? And so, um, uh, it's uh, it's uh, the connections that you have. It's the um, the the um, 
um, you know, if you go to, if you're from a, a from a particular upper upper class or upper a middle a middle or upper class, and get to socialize with it, with other individuals who are in that same group, you get introduced to a particular network of individuals who who think alike, who who you these these become your uh, contacts, your business contacts. In, these are individuals who are good, who you're going to know in society, and who and who um, and who know you, and so. Um, individuals from lower SES and so lower socioeconomic classes don't often get the opportunities to meet other individuals outside of their class. And so um, social capital is something that that basically um, enforces itself. So um, the rich basically hang out with the rich, interact with the rich, make contacts with the rich, um, and uh, marry r other rich people's kids, and, and the money stays, you know, and the power stays within one, one space. In contrast, poor people kind of go to school with the poor, they hang out with the poor, they work with the poor, they 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 live and, and commune with the poor and shop with the poor. And so they they end up marrying people who are often in their same social class. And so uh, Bourdieu, base, Bourdieu's basic argument is that, you know, that something is happening in society that 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 um, is split along among classes that that reproduces this class ideology in the larger social order. And part of it, part of that way is through social ties. So the social connections that we make um, as we as we grow up in and within society, um, the other kind of component is this, is this concept of of cultural capital, um, and cultural capital is is more than just kind of like um, more than just what you know. That's what I put on the on the slide, but it's also kind of engenders like mores and um, uh, behaviors, actions, um, um, how to comport yourself, what's proper, what are the proper ways to act, to act and behave, um, things like, um, uh, um, how to, how to, uh, order from a menu, how to eat from, you know, at a, at a dinner when you're eating with your course, uh, with your forks and, uh, from the outside in work your way in from the, from the outer uh, to the in where, where is, what side is your bread, uh, side, what side's your, your, um, your drink side, all of those things are all part of cultural capital. Um, and these are things you learn with uh, within uh, within your social group, right? These are these these are things that that are either you either are learn them because you grew up with them, or you or you learn them because you're taught with them. That's why there was like this proliferation of you know classes like cotillion and things like that to teach people you know um, how to act and how to behave. And so um, these these ideas is that you know these that what's valid in society are things that are that either mi middle classes or upper classes are are uh, you know are find um, or name um, and identify as 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 ways to act you know these are civilized ways of, of acting and so with the with the understanding that the the poor the, the 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 dispossessed don't have these you know because they're they're so uncultured they don't have these particular um ways of, of behaving and so that's the idea right and so there's a there's another kind of class component that's there that that reproduces these these differences um and one is valid in society over another and so um but these these don't these don't happen by by chance. They don't happen by accident. They they are they are ways in which you know um, the the upper classes, the ruling classes, have actually established these particular mores. And so so all, so you know for from the beginning of time, to be is to be like, and to be like is to be like them. And so everybody everybody the poor is always trying to to make it out in in into these classes. Uh, you know the 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 lower class wants to make it into the middle class. The middle class wants to make it into the upper class. And uh, and so this this the sense that you can again that you can make it through uh, and and uh, and if you, again if you work hard enough you can you can um, you can you can be anybody you want to be in society that's part of the ideology that that's there but Bourdieu was basically saying that off, that rarely happens the poor you know by and large the poor are born poor they stay poor they marry poor and uh, and and they have poor uh, if you will uh, ways mores and and values of of the poor that's that's who your social work is or your social network is whereas the rich kind of uh, the same thing's happening with the rich and the same thing is happening with the middle class and so that's a, an explanation of how society kind of ends up reproducing itself over and over again because of the stratifications that exist within society so Bourdieu uses this concept of capital um and that and that these these um 
uh, these social networks basically and and these cultural forms have some sort of currency exchange or value there's, there's a particular value that's there right and so if you if you're um, if I'm a, a wealthy individual who, who went to a particular uh, school um, in 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 society I might I might be introduced to individuals who are the children of, of doctors, lawyers, um, or, or business owners, um, CEOs, um, uh, exec executives, et cetera. Uh, and, uh, and they in turn will um, create different, will, 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 uh, I'll be part of that particular social network and I will have these kinds of business contracts. And so again, is there's a, there's an economic, if you will, um, uh, uh, value, or there's an economic um, uh, benefit of um, being part of these particular groups in the same way um, that low SES don't have that, that same kind of economic currency associated with it and with their, within their social networks. So Bourdieu's um, concepts are important. Now, Terry also um, utilized the concept of cultural capital and really kind of explored it and really what took that um, in a different way. Tara Yasso, uh, who's the person who, who framed and coined this concept of community cultural wealth, said, said that the poor, um, and particularly um, poor people of color, they have a lot of capital. It's just capital that's not valued in, in society. And so she kind of coined the different kinds of capital that, that, that individuals have using a critical race theory lens. For example, you know, we have familial capital, familial capital being like the, the networks that we have, the families that we have, the strong bonds that, that families of color have, um, especially, for example, Latinx families who not only have the, um, the internal bond uh, of the families, but then they have extended kin networks that, that extend beyond the family. Uh, you see that in, in, um, in Af within African-American communities in which there's more of a community-based ethic um, that's there. And so this kind of familial capital becomes really important navigational capital about how how you can navigate the system and survive how to make how to make ends meet on a you know uh, on, on a on a on a single paycheck or or on you know on a on a paycheck that's that's that, that barely has enough for the rent but yet people know how to how to um uh, find the best uh, sales and how to get stuff, how to, how to stretch that dollar um, to, the, to, you know, to maximize it and still save, that's navigational capital, right? And so there's other ways in which, uh, in which um, uh, poor individuals, low SES individuals uh, and people of color, um, you know, how they um, uh, utilize the, the capital in order to survive in, um, in, uh, in, in society, survive and not just survive, but thrive as well. And so it's important for, for, for us to recognize that cultural capital isn't just something that's, that the upper classes have. Everybody has uh, cultural capital. But Tara Yasso's work was really kind of utilizing um, this idea that the, the particular cultural capital that, that low SES individuals um, uh, possess is not, is not lower than or less than, it's actually a form of community cultural wealth. It's something that, that, sh that, that is there, that exists, that's real, and that people should be looking at it and capitalizing on that and, and looking at it as a form of strength as opposed to a source of weakness or, or deficiency uh, within uh, low SES communities. So Terry Asso's concept of, of, of uh, cultural capital is, an, is a concept that was taken up within um, uh, the readings for this week. Culturally responsive leadership was the third concept that, that was taken up and, uh, and um, it emerged from the work of culturally relevant teaching, which really focuses on what? Like that, that's focused on the curriculum, that, that, that um, um, what is taught. Uh, that work emerged from the work of Gloria Latson Billings and uh, and uh, Geneva Gay um, focused on culturally responsive pedagogy, how that material is taught. So you know, it's not just what you're teaching and whether the curriculum reflects reflects you and reflects a diverse uh, diversity, but also the ways in which you you engage the curriculum, the ways in which you're utilizing those knowledges, the, those funds of knowledge from within the community. Um, uh, and tap into those to, to tap into those knowledges and 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 discourses and ways of talking and and uh, and how you connect with kids. Those are all part of um, uh, um, 
uh, culturally responsive uh, uh, pedagogy, according to Geneva Gay and others. Um, and so the work of culturally responsive leadership was taken up by Mohammed Khalifa, uh, Mark Gooden, um, uh, uh, James O. Davis, and a couple of others um, who kind of have, have uh, come after them, but they basically said, okay, well, if there's this idea of, of culturally responsive um, uh, teaching and culturally responsive curriculum, then there should be this idea of culturally responsive school leadership. And, uh, and so the culturally responsive school leadership really focuses on those behaviors of, of principles, the, the actions, the mannerisms, the, the, the policies they, 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 um, they put in place, the kinds of discussions that they have within their classrooms, how they comport themselves, the kind of um, uh, how they, how they um, interact with, uh, with other teachers um, uh, and uh, how they create you know, a climate of, for learning and a culture of, uh, of learning, particularly that's focused on um, the, the, the educational needs, the social needs, the political needs, the cultural needs of students, especially our most diverse students. And so there's, there's, a, there's a way in which, you, in which the school leader really kind of utilizes their, um, their, uh, their gifts to, in order to, to create a culture and a climate that's really focused on educational success uh, for kids. And that, that in, engenders and necessitates having tough discussions in, in schools, uh, um, 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 oh my gosh, I'm, I just lost the word. Um, it's it dealt with the courageous conversations. That's what I was uh, looking for, and you know, you to, to have these courageous conversations in schools about race and racism, to confront these issues, and to do it in a way that that is not confrontative or combative, uh, where individuals will be, you know, raising their, you know, uh, their their. Uh, you know, antennae and saying, no, I'm, I'm, I, I refuse, I don't want to kind of go into this space, but really doing it in a way that, that brings the, the school along, that has these, these conversations about race and racism uh, and, um, and uh, cultural differences and, and, um, and uses, util, utilizes these conversations to not just strengthen teaching, but um, help teachers understand their students and, and parents better. That's the that's what culturally responsive leadership is. It is it is much more uh, a focus on the behavior of individuals, what they do, uh, and uh, and um, and how those how how what they do um, contributes to a better environment for um, kids of color. Um, how are these three connected? You know, um, is probably the question that's important. And I think that, you know, uh, I think that it's pretty obvious that um, if you have a personal history, if you're a person of color, if you experience this, if you grew up poor, you know, you, you can be a low SES white individual that has, you know, that gives you a certain worldview. It gives you a certain way of looking at the world. We saw that in the, in Catherine Rodella's work. We saw that in David DeMatthew's work, you know, that these individuals who had this particular, um, you know, upbringing, saw the world in a, in a particular way and saw some of the challenges that, that they, that they um, uh, you know, wanted to address when they became school leaders. And so that worldview really propelled how they acted and what they did in, in, in their schools. You know, but sometimes you don't, need, you don't have to be, you know, the, it raises the question like, you know, hey, do I have to be a, a, a person of color or do I have to have grown up poor in order for me to, to, to be effective with this particular group? No, you know, the, that's the, the quick answer. The question, the, the answer is, is more about, you know, um, it's your worldview. It's, it's, do you have a, a worldview that, that is willing to, um, that, that is empathetic, that understands, um, you know, that the, these, um, uh, kids and, and, and these contexts that has, that understands, um, the pervasiveness of racism that understands, um, that racism is not just kind of something that, that, that is perpetrated by an individual, but it's something that's embedded in society, including schools. And what are we going to do about that? How, what are you willing to do about that as, as a school principal? That is part of that worldview. And so, you know, if you, if you can provide a different perspective that's focused on, 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 on equality or inequality, um, you know, in, in, uh, and, and the sources of inequality, then that's where um, uh, it becomes important because it's 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 what you're bringing into that space as a leader and how you have those those discussions uh, in in a way that is um, both culturally relevant and um, and culturally responsive. It becomes, I think, um, uh, kind of really key uh, key mechanisms for implementing change. But you know, the idea is that you're asking a different set of questions, or you're or you're seeking a different set of answers to perennial problems that exist 
crisis in society, including um, school failure for kids. Um, you 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 do not want to see that um, happening, especially within your school. Not not because you know the district is is demanding or placing you know demands on you and expectations, and I have to meet this particular threshold. Or and if and if I don't, then you know my my butt's on the line, or I will be you know um, you know that's accountability, but that's accountability to the state. In this particular in this particular example, it's accountability to kids. It's accountability to families. It's accountability to communities. It's it's making sure that that communities are all right. Um, and that's the 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 difference is that you know you're not your boss, if you will, is not the is not the state. It's not your district. It's it's your it's the the individuals whom who um, who who uh, are enrolled in your school. It's the communities that are that are there. They're the ones that that uh, are the lifeblood, and you're working to to try to make schools better. You're working towards a better future for them, and uh, and so it it. Uh, it requires or it opens up a different way to work with this with these uh, particular communities because you you um, believe have a different um, um, uh, belief set that's driving your actions that's driving your behaviors and so it is related to to a different leadership style and that and and again this idea that you know that if that you're 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 not just kind of doing this for the sake of doing of doing things you're not just checking the box or going through tests because the state's requiring it but you're doing this because it's it's uh, it's the right thing to do uh it's it's a it's a equity is a is a and social justice are um, goals in themselves. They're not a means towards an end. They're an end in themselves. The means towards an end is like, I want to focus on social justice so that my grades can come up, or I want to focus on social justice because if I do that, then, you know, then I'll have well-behaved kids. No, you know, it's, that, that's a, that's, that's kind of a, a, a really bad or dysfunctional way of thinking about equity. You know, equity should be for the purposes of equity, for the sake of equity, so that you can make a real difference in, in the lives of kids. That's the challenge that in, that leaders step into the role when they raise their hands and say, I wanna be a professional educator. The, they're, they're making that commitment to kids. They're making the commitment to, to uh, communities to improve their, to improve communities um, and as an end in itself, because it's the right thing to do as opposed to some sort of means um, uh, towards, towards an end. Um, you know, I, I get a better paycheck or I get, um, I get a, um, you know, a, a principal of the year award or, or my school will look good. And as, and I, I, because it's no longer, um, on the, on the naughty list because our kids were underperforming, you know, again, it's, it's a, it's a different kind of leadership style and, and the leadership styles that we saw in Anishimaru text, um, for example, the ways in which these principals were having these courageous conversations with these, with the, with these, um, um, uh, with our teachers, it really emerged from a space of love. It really emerged from a space of wanting to make a difference. And so that's the kind of leadership style that's there. And so that's what's that's where the field is going as a whole. It's uh, it's kind of moving away from the grand leader who is responsible to you know for for their entire school and who makes decisions by themselves. It's looking at you know as uh, leaders as networked and connected, not just to teachers, but networked and connected to students and networking and connected to communities. And it's the the the, um, the this kind of outlook of, of of wanting to make your school a better place for all learners. Um, that's what's the important piece um, that 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 um, recognizes inequities in society. That recognizes your role as admin as, a, as an administrator to change. Um, you know um, the 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 historic um, uh, you know uh, patterns of uh, of um, lack of educational success and failure you know you want to change that and you want to and you and you engage in strategic practices that that help your teachers uh move towards um this path of social justice and equity so that is the lecture in a nutshell i hope that uh that uh you got a chance to learn a little bit uh, uh from this today and i um again um Look forward to seeing you all next week with your projects. Take care and um, have a good one.